Hallelujah. Are you blessed this morning? We thank God for yesterday. We thank God also for my very good friend, Bishop Gideon Titi Ophel, a very outstanding, a very outstanding man of God. Very, very much respected. I keep on saying that he brought Christian education into the ministry. Yeah, he's the one who has taught us that you can be a pastor, you must also get bachelor degree in this and so many things. And his school, his church is full of such things. And he's giving awarding scholarship for people to come and study. It's like he has proven that you must be knowledgeable even as a pastor. Say amen. He's also one of our main speakers anytime we do Christ in the rural world. He's always there to teach, and his teachings are very, 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 very powerful. And he's become part of our team. Say amen. He's a true friend and a brother, and I'll always enjoy listening. I'm never tired listening to him. Anytime he's teaching, he's bringing new things. He's always developing new concepts in ministry. And I'm telling you, for the next uh, two hours, you are going to be blessed by this man's teaching. And uh, without mis wasting my time, uh, I want us to all be upstanding and welcome all the way from uh, Spring Test Road, Pleasant Places Church, my good friend, Bishop Gideon Titi Ofer. Amen. Amen. Blessed and excited to be here this morning. I salute um, Dr. Steve Mason for the great work he's doing and all the leadership here. Yeah. I remember where we came from, Bogatanga. I was there late and left earlier. And uh, he has been there for days. And the next morning, I saw him in church. I was considering not to go to church. <laughs> I told my wife that, I'm so sorry. And then the early morning he was in church. I'm like, this man and the passion for the kingdom and his heart for the kingdom. Let's celebrate him for the amazing work he's doing. Amen. It's always a joy to be here and to share with you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this blessed morning. We ask that our leadership character be shaped and our leadership skills be sharpened before we live here. Speak, O oh God, to us through your word, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Fantastic. So in tandem with your theme for this year, I'm speaking to you on building your shepherding capacity for excellent pastoring. Building your shepherding capacity for excellent pastoring. You can't talk about excellence without referring to Daniel chapter 6, verse 1 to 3. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes who should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was one, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above, was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. You know, when you hear expression like an excellent spirit, you would think that it was an anointing. But it was a behavior. It was a capacity. You understand? It was a capacity. And I want us to so what is excellence? And how do we attain it? What is excellence and how do we attain it? So, excellence, in my opinion, is the capacity to attain the highest grade in performance management. So all of us, by the time the year will be ending, even if there are no systems in place to measure your performance, 
the Holy Spirit whom you serve will convict you and show you your performance. Are you here? We are, only, we are almost two months into the new year. And already you should be assessing your performance already. The highest grade, you know when you go to school and you are tested, you write an examination. The highest grade you get is excellent. So you can get fail, pass, good, and then very good, and then excellent. Because your performance will always be measured. No matter what you do, your performance will be measured. So today I'm going to focus on how you can build capacity for excellence in ministry. How you can build capacity for excellence in ministry. Charles, can we see the next slide? Now look at this. Psalm 78 verse 72. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart and with skillful hands he led them. Two key things you must take note of. One, integrity of heart. David shepherded them with integrity of heart. Are you here? And as moral leaders, I believe that most of us here have integrity of heart. But being a good person does not mean that you will be a good leader. Are you here? They are very good people who are not good leaders. But they are good husbands. They won't cheat on their wives. They won't beat their wives. They will, they will supply every need in the house. But they are not good leaders. So the wife has to take over the house and run the house. If the wife left the children alone for him, the children will become wayward. You understand? So you can be very, very good. There should be one president of Ghana. He was a very good man, but he was not a good leader. So you can be a good pastor. You can be a good pastor. We can all testify about you. Oh, this guy, eh? his morality, eh? he has integrity of heart. He's very loyal. But then, apart from we measuring you against morality, we cannot measure you against performance. It is called successful failure syndrome. You understand? So you can be successful in one area and fail in another area. Are, are you, are you, do you understand what I'm talking about? So you can have a very morally upright pastor pastoring a collapsing branch. Are, are you here? And all the church members who say, oh, I have a pastor there. He hasn't got any problem. Oh, he's a good man. Oh. We don't understand why the branch is not growing. Because the man is a good man. The man is a good man, but we don't understand. And your congregation too, they don't understand that goodness is not a substitute for skills. You, you understand? Pastoral skills is different from having a good heart. So, sometimes eh, our major problem is how we think good people can be good pastors. Okay? If we only look at pastoring as behavior, then you can be a good pastor. But pastoring fundamentally is behavior, but functionally, it depends on skills. Skills beyond good behavior. So thank God for behaving well. But please, perform well too. So, are you here? So David shepherded them with integrity of heart and with skillful hands, he led them. So David's leadership of, the, of his kingdom was based on skillful hands. He had a good heart. In fact, he had a good heart. His heart was so good that God said he was a man after my heart and that God looked at his heart and God, his heart qualified him by his skills, sustained him in that position. Are you here? We, 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 we love you for the way you behave. 
we celebrate your good behavior. And we thank God that you do not bring the name of the Lord and the calling of this church and the mission of the man of God here into this repute. We thank you that your lights will shine before me, that they glorify your Father in heaven. But please, don't preside over a collapsing branch. And use your good name as collateral. Are you here? Do you know if we're a good person, eh, you can easily win the hearts of people. The most difficult person to discipline is the good person who is not performing. He has sympathies. He has people who, are, who can easily sympathize with them. You, you, you understand? For them, you are a good person. But for Reverend Steve, he is looking for two things. Be good and deliver. Have a good heart, but have a smart mind too. So you have a good mind, heart, but you don't have a smart mind. And so Reverend Steve wants to take you from that branch. Then your branch leaders will come and say, oh, dog, leave him for us. We are begging you. He is a good person. He is a good person. And there are 25. 25 people, but you are good. You even preach very good sermons. And so you are good. But you see, in ministry, good is good, but performance is better. Okay? So behave well, but perform too. So my duty today is to focus on showing you the modern skills that every pastor needs to be able to perform. You understand? So traditionally, and traditionally, there are pastoral skills like counseling, pastoral skills like naming children, uh, food, attending funerals. There are people who know how to do all those things. So. But now because of the sophistication of members, those, in fact, now members can even pay to get psychologists and all those things to counsel them. In fact, there are some members in your church who will not come to marriage counseling with you. They will rather go and hire a private marriage counselor and they will counsel them. There are members in your church when they even die, how to give them post-traumatic counseling and all those things. They are good, but you may not have the skills. They will look for some doctors. It happens to all of us. You will see one of your members will come and be talking to you and will tell you that, oh, after the incident, I got some psychologist. You know, you know that you did not meet the need. So the person is there. But there are other key skills that a 21st century pastor must have. And it's going to help you build a very unique ministry. Okay, so today, my duty is to take you through those skills. There are some I'll just brush through. There are others I'll just, I'll go in details. Okay, so seven is, is skill, essential skills of highly successful pastors. The modern pastor. I've said it here years ago. I summarized it here years ago. So today I'm just going to take my time. Good. So the first is tactical skills. The second is, oh, no, don't go. Let me just, just come back. I'll just summarize it before I go. So tactical skills. The second is organizational skills. The third is relational skills. The fourth, oratorical skills. The fifth, thinking skills. The six, listening skills, and the seven, team building skills. If you add these seven skills to the already existing traditional pastoral skills, so you see what, what I'm not doing is that I am not I'm adding to what you learned in the Bible school. I have always told people that when you are coming to my training, make sure you have Bible school education. Because I do executive training for pastors. So I don't go, so I do practical theology. So you must have theology, theology. And then you can add my practical theology to it. So you see, I'm not going to go into um, um, counseling skills, how to counsel, how to counsel a person with trauma, how to counsel a person who has just been divorced, how to counsel a person who just lost a loved one. You see, those things they will teach you in Bible school. And you may already know. There are even people here who may know it better than me. But I'm teaching you what they will not teach you in Bible school. You understand? I'm teaching you what will make you relevant both within the walls of the church and outside the walls of the church. 
Bible school prepares you for a mission within the walls of the church. I want to add to what Bible school has given you so that you can be also relevant outside the four walls of the church. Are, are you here with me? Good. So now let's take the tactical skills. You see, tactical skills is strategic positioning in this context in leadership. You see, what every one of you here should learn to do is how, so I'm going to talk on two levels. The first level I'm going to focus on, your tactical positioning around Reverend Steve. And then the next one is your tactical positioning. No, Charles, just stay on that hand. Your tactical positioning in your branch or among the pastors. So first, let me focus on your tactical position around Reverend Steve. Let me tell you this. Some of you will be here for a very long time, but will become still insignificant. You see, there were a lot of soldiers around Saul, but the appearance of Goliath made them very insignificant until David showed up. You see, your significance around the leader is to provide a solution to a problem he's struggling with. Are you here? Let me tell you this. You are not around Reverend Steve to become a problem he is solving. You are around him to solve a problem he is struggling to solve. Goliath was a problem Saul was trying to solve. And was trying, he tried his best, but he could not solve it. Until David showed up. Now David became very significant in the life of Saul because of David's ability to solve problems. How David strategically positioned himself. Are you here? So you need to look around Reverend Steve in the church. There are spaces there are spaces nobody is occupying. There are problems nobody is solving. It is not all of you who must mount the pulpit. Are you here with me? It is not every one of you who must mount the pulpit. Though. Sometimes the most, you see, the most important person in my life, a minister apart from my wife, is Charles, the gentleman I brought here. I'm even trying to ordain Charles as the children's pastor because he lost children and was the children's department on weekends, weekdays he's in my office from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And I'm trying to ordain him, Charles, let me make you a pastor. No. Okay, Dickon, no. But he's the most important person in my life, apart from my wife and God. I'm telling you, maintains my schedules, knows where my money is, knows everything. Very important because he solves problems that as a leader, sometimes we as leaders, we move. We, we focus so much on the vision and we keep moving. If they are stepping, uh, stumbling stones, we might not even see it. And then when, once we are moving, we leave things behind. Some people come from behind us and pick the things we leave behind and fix them for us. You understand? And fix them for us and put them in. It's called strategic positioning. When I was growing up as a young Christian, like I always said, Reverend Steve and his brothers were already successful in ministry. They were doing well. I, I just wrote my, 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 my pastoral career. And I said that, let me, let me, let me do what is not normally done within the charismatic fraternity. Let them call me the letter killer. But I know I have the spirit. So I said, you see, let me just develop myself as a knowledge-based pastor. Come out with certain kind of trainings that are not available within the charismatic fraternity. I just said to myself that in every profession, there is executive development for them. After going through, if you're a medical doctor, if you finish a medical school, annually you go for executive development programs, professional development programs. But pastors, we don't have it. 
So I said, let me start developing the concepts of professional development for pastors. Let me develop myself. Let me cast myself in the mode of a leadership coach. In the mode of a leadership coach. You see, let me cast myself in something. And I said, okay, let me legitimate my teaching with the church. In fact, the normal circumstances, I would not have built it. If I were in America, I would be like John Maxwell. Just focus more on running leadership conferences and building the capacity. But within our environment, if we are going to teach pastors how to pastor, they will tell you, where is your church? Have you pastored? So my, my church, you see, the law of legitimacy states that you cannot successfully, you cannot teach on what you have not successfully practiced. So my church is my legitimacy. But my real calling is to do these things I'm doing. I love it. And if I honestly, do you know that I love speaking to smaller groups than bigger groups? When I meet small people, groups of people, I share with them, we ask questions, I impart them. After several years, you'll find somebody doing well somewhere. And you come to you and say, um, Bishop, you know, I came here and you taught something. I went to apply it and the thing is working for me. And it's going well, I'm bringing you a tithe. And then that's where you say, okay, God is here. Do you understand? So you see, I, I have become important to these men because I, I tactically developed myself. To occupy the spaces around them. Yeah. Yeah. Are you here? Yeah. And that's why every year, Reverend Steve will have me here. Yeah. That's why every year when he's doing his crusades, he will call me and say, Titi, you are coming home. Titi, the way you will say it, you will say, it's not an, it's not an invitation, it's a commandment. <laughs> Titi, you are coming home. And then I have to be there for them. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Are you here with me? So around Reverend Steve, those of you who will be significant the next 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and become almost indispensable in this ministry, will be people who are tactical in their thinking. Tactical in their thinking. I've said that there are two S's that will make your ministry grow, that will make any church grow. Spirituality and strategy. Be 90% spiritual, but make sure you are 10% strategic. Are you here? It was the same strategy that Joshua adopted. There were elders whom God took the spirit of Moses and put on them, but none of them succeeded Moses. Because Joshua was tactical. Moses went on the mountaintop. He waited for him. Whilst others were doing other things, he waited for him. Others were prophesying in the tent. Moses was, Joshua was pouring water on Moses' hand. Tactical positioning. Or the same tactical positioning that Elisha adopted when he followed Elijah. There were others in the school of the prophet who never got his mantle until the man who the man who understood how to strategically position himself around the man of God. So strategic positioning is very crucial. Don't look for the pulpit. Don't look for any big thing you want to do. Look, because listen, Listen, if Reverend still gives you his puppet, you will never measure up to 10% to his experience. So, so, so sometimes when he's giving you his puppet, beg him that I would rather pray. Because, because when you come in, you expose your weakness. Eh? You expose your weakness. You see, the simplicity, the humorous way, the connection he has with the congregation when he is speaking. You, you get it? So if you sit down there, you say, hey, hey, they have to let me preach some. They have to let me preach some. Ask David why he refused Saul's uh, armor. I said, this is too big for me. It is too big for me. Please take it off me. It is too big for me. Take it off me. In fact, Saul trusted him when he made that choice. Saul realized, okay, he doesn't want. Because in the armor of Saul are his um, army badges. And once you wear it, you have taken his position. David said, no, no, the position you're giving me is too big. It's too big, it's too big. I, I, I'm not interested in that. I just came to kill Goliath, not for a position. <laughs> Are you here? Now, sometimes you wonder that, but if I don't get a position, who will see me? How will I get to where I have to get to? I need to, in the next 10 years, I must be the assistant pastor and people will see me in this church. Why Joseph was never the head of anything. But Joseph is one of the most efficient leaders. In fact, when you talk about the chosen generation from Abraham coming, Joseph stands out. In fact, Joseph stands out. 
Apart from Abraham, Joseph stands out more than Isaac and more than Jacob. I'm telling you, but if you look at Joseph, eh, he was never the head of anything. He was not the head of, of, of Potiphar's house. But he was very efficient. Very efficient. He was not the head of the prison, but he was very efficient. He was not the head of Egypt, but very efficient. So how do we discuss the leadership qualities of a man who was never the head of anything? Are you here? Anybody who is thinking that unless I'm given a position, I cannot function. He's not a leader. Are you here? Because leadership is not a position. Leadership is a function. Positions are only created for leaders to give them space to operate after you have shown your leadership qualities. When we started church and we were young pastors, if we saw a nice man with a nice car came to church and was successful in his office, we assumed that if he became a leader in the church, the church will grow and will make impact. We just realized that you appoint these people, you anoint them with oil. You can pour a gallon of uh, olive oil and pray for three hours on them. All they will do is to have a special seat and sit down. And now they want, when they are coming, they want ushers to carry their bags that the way they will carry pastors' bag. You, you understand? Because leadership begins when you are able to function without a position. And you identify spaces around the person you are following. And you fill those spaces for the person. And you are not interested in yourself, but interested in the person. I've said it here before, that the greatest and the most efficient way to learn leadership is through followership. Well, it is where you follow a leader better than you, greater than you, more knowledgeable than you, and you put at, your, at that leader's disposal your skills, your abilities, your resources to promote his vision. And in the process, you learn on the job. Are you here? I'm a very well-educated man. But 90% of the things I know, I didn't get them through education, through the classroom. I got them through experience on the field. On the field. You understand? On the field. I go to Christ the World World's mission, and I'm there learning. I'm there learning. How can a man be so selfless like Reverend Steve? Create a big platform and decide that people should just come on the platform, and yet the thing is successful, and yet he's recognized, and yet he's valued, and yet people know that he's a visioneer. Do you understand? How some of you in your branches... You don't have Reverend Steele's picture. It's your picture. Sometimes even if you have him, he's at your back. And you are there like this. <laughs> you are not popular, popular. You are not a brand. Nobody knows you. Nobody knows you. So why, why, why is your picture there? <laughs> Do you understand me? Hey, how many of you know the Christ Embassy pastor in Ghana? How many of you have seen him face to face? Because, you see, Nigerians are very smart. They know that Chris is the brand. He appeals to people more than them. What they are looking for is the crowd. And when you get the crowd, you become famous. So, Chris Pitcher. For see Ghanaian pastors who are passing branches. At Fabrodia Betumichok. You see them and their wives. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So you, you need to learn how to strategically look, look out for. You may be in the branch, but your presence at the headquarters and the events at the headquarters must be felt. Must be felt. Are you here? It's not for you to sit somewhere and look at all the loopholes around Reverend Steve and begin to complain and begin to criticize. Hey, I saw the way. 
You have a pastor synod. Cry, you have an opening prayer. Pastor synod, eh? Where is your call? Pastor synod. Who is your opening prayer? Who is it? Opening prayer, you have an opening prayer. Who is the last one? You have a closing prayer. Yeah, yeah. Inti, inti, you can't why you do. You can't why you do. Who is your closing prayer? Yeah, yeah. Inti, you can't why you do. But you see, the reason why you got closing prayer to do is because what you do by your works. Talk less, work hard, and you will strategically position yourself. At one point, you'll be dead. And then Reverend Stephen said, will call you. And you wonder, how did this man get my this thing? But he noticed it. He saw it when you came to Synod. Your selflessness, the time you came to sit down, when you came to Synod, how you came early to sweep the place and make sure everything was good. He saw your movement. He saw how selfless, how the interest of the church was above your personal interest. How when the light went off and people were finding themselves doing, and they wanted the thing to close so that they can go out. How you got up and you went outside there and you were trying to find somebody. And you, you see, these things, eh, they catch the attentions of leaders. Are, are, are you here? Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm teaching you? Hmm. So that is the level at your leadership level at the general level of the church. Now, also, at your own local church level, you have to strategically position yourself as a pastor. And I'm going to look at it from the point of view of you providing very solid leadership. In marketing, there's something we call marketing segmentation. You have to be able to differentiate various people in the market and who you want to target and who you want to reach. There is also something I call leadership segmentation. How not to lamp up everybody and lead them? How you, for you as a pastor in your branch, how you should strategically position yourself and deal with different people in different ways. Ways. How to adapt different leadership styles for different people so you can get the best out of them. Can I show you? The next slide, please. So look at it, the modern pastor and how he leads. First, let's take the one from the top. Those you lead from behind. Those you lead from behind. Those you lead from behind. So you see, you know how sometimes pastors, we assume that we know everything and people don't know anything. And so we assume that without us, the church cannot move on and we have all the responsibilities on us and we don't trust anybody to do anything at all. Just recently, 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 people who came to our church when they were in SS and somewhere were in primary school, recently I was just sitting down one day and the choir was singing and I saw some of them have become chartered accountants, some of them have become lawyers, some of them have MBAs, some of them are doing well. But I just realized that I've always looked at them the way they came to church, that those small boys and girls, so I said, no, 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 Charlie, I have the human resource in this church, and I am paying pastors to do the work that these people can do. So I said, okay, let me start using them in different ways. So our youth today is led by someone who is not a pastor, but is the most efficient and effective youth system that our church has ever been. But it's led by someone who is not a pastor, but has sat under me for so many years. So I said, okay, let not pastors, let me leave prayer meetings and things for pastors. You guys do MCC, do this, do this. Then they man the pulpit and even one scripture and they explain it. And I feel like, why don't I let this person preach this Sunday? Because where he's coming from, I didn't see it that way. You know, and I'm seeing them showing a lot of things. So your ability and capacity to be able to identify some people and efficiently and effectively delegate responsibilities and allow these people to lead whilst you follow, come from behind and supervise. You understand? And then there are those that you lead from the front. These are people who are emerging. Those you come and they follow you and you tell them what to do. 
Those who live from behind, sometimes they advise you on what to do. And then there are those you lead from the left. They are your left hand men. Now, these are people eh, who have certain skills that you don't even have. They have certain capacity that you don't even have. Now, let me, <laughs> my wife is doing her master's at Trinity. And we just discovered that there are so many people who are not pastors but who love the Bible, who wants to learn the Bible. When these people leave Trinity after their masters and they come and sit in your congregation, they will analyze your sermons and contextualize it and pretextualize it and theologically disseminate your sermon. That is why it's very important that when people come to church, you let them fill forms. You know their profession. You know their qualifications so that you can use them effectively and efficiently. There are some people in your church eh, who are very powerful and good on social media. When you go to their own Instagram and uh, Facebook, the people that follow them, they are more than people who follow you. But you don't use them. You don't call them and tell them, I'm giving you the social media handles. So these people, you lead them from behind and you give them responsibilities. And there are those on your left eh, who know more than you. Those, eh, you are powerful. You have, you know, so, sometimes eh, when you don't have confidence in yourself and you see well-educated people coming to your church, you say, I belong for you, I have you. So I belong for me. You, you, don't like, you don't like people who are confident. <laughs> you understand? People who are confident. People who don't melt before you. Sometimes they, they question your decisions. Or so for. Now, I think we are more toy. Invoices are in our jail. Because on idea we own. Oh, the invoices be brea. Come to me, beat it price and down. I didn't know where they The one he leaves the meeting. Why he leaves the meeting? How dare him come and question my authority? Have I not been doing this before he came? You see, but you are getting left hand men, people that can really help you build the church. People with, with, with certain skills that you, it would take you a lot of money to employ. They are offering it for free. They are offering it for free. One of the skills every pastor must have is people's management skills. How to manage people, how to identify and harness the potential of the members of your church. I, I think that's what Church of Pentecost, I think that's why even Bishop Dak and Co. did from the beginning of the, their churches. Yeah. Identified people with skills and then used their skills uh, by vocational and they were there. I mean, when somebody goes through the walls of the university, their mind is ready for anything. That's why if you are going to work in a bank, you don't even have banking and finance. Just have sociology. Just have anything. But sometimes the, bank, the banking uh, industry prefer people who do not have banking and finance. They prefer people who are very versatile. You know? And then they, once you have gone through the walls of the university, your mind is exercised. Anything they teach you, you can pick it. That's why, that's why some of the most successful pastors in this country are not pastors who went to four-year theological, who do four-year theological education. They don't, they don't have PhD in theology. They don't even have BSc in theology. BA in theology, no. MPhil in theology, no. They don't have. And that's why those with MPhil in theology are also very frustrated. They feel that we with MPhil in theology, people don't come to our church. These people don't have anything. They're not teaching anything. But you see, when somebody picks the Bible and the person is prayerful and the person's mind is very alert, the person even understands the Bible better. Are you here with me? And that is why people who know things that you don't know must be people you must use in the church. And then your right hand man. Some of the people who are my right hand men, eh, like Charles I'm talking about, there are some guys Without them, I am nothing. I'm telling you, without them, I am nothing. Yeah. How do you control the system and make sure everything is in order? Recently, I um, had a group of pastors who felt that one guy in the church was becoming too powerful. They felt he was becoming too powerful. Me too, when I was a young pastor, 
pastor, I felt that some non-pastoral staff were becoming too powerful around my spiritual father. And I used to complain. And now I'm in Yabeto. So when my pastors come, I just advise them. I say, you know something? You will always find people around pastors who are more powerful than pastors. I said, these guys around me, eh? you people will leave me. They will still be here. You see, you, you won't be long. You say God has told you to go and start a church. They, they won't come and tell me that. So I'm not going to offend them for you. So manage it. You understand? No, listen, listen. There are some pillars. Don't break them. No matter how difficult it is for you, don't break them. Decorate them nicely and leave them inside. You see, when you go to some churches, eh, and you see pillars, you don't, you, don't, you don't feel like preaching. But when I came here, I saw these pillars. The way they are nicely done. I just said, oh, so we can put pillars in church and still have a nice church. <laughs> and the way they are well positioned. You understand? So sometimes, eh, you find some people in, around pastors who are very powerful. They are powerful. When you go to pastor's meeting and you make decisions, your senior pastor will call them and find out from there, this is what we decided. What do you think? And then they'll say, oh, don't do it this way, don't do it this way. So sometimes you feel like, oh, after we are done all this, you go and talk to them. But you see, this particular person, they came to raise the issue with him. He has his own business. So. But any time I pass around the church, he's there. There are some broken things. He's making sure they are facing it. There are things that are not well done. He's making sure they are doing it. Um, 6 a.m. 6 a.m. on Sunday he's in church. Making sure everything is in position. And he does that because he's looking at me. Does, Daddy doesn't like this. When he comes, this thing is done. So when the pastors are later on arriving, and then you come and you tell him, do this or do that, he now feels that it is your duty. You are the people who are employed here full time and you are paid. You are supposed to have come earlier. To see to it that everything is organized in church. So don't come later to try to control me. They don't understand. They come to me. And my position always is that, listen, what he's doing, if I take it from me, I give it to you, and you can do it. I will deal with him right now. So you should like give me that promise. That I can come and sit here from morning to evening to make sure that things are being welded and go to town and go and buy all these things and make sure that you are financially clean. You are not doing trouble. You are not doing anything. If you give me those promises, I will just let him stop what he's doing and you will do it. These people, the people that are sometimes the right-hand men of men of God are not even pastors. Yeah. Are you here? Are not even pastors. And your pastors know that the church functions and moves on because of these people who are available. Are you here? Because of these who are available. For instance, if the head of women's fellowship is not a pastor, but she's well educated, understands the needs of women, she has powerful organizational skills, and is running the women's fellowships with such an efficiency, there's no way Reverend Steve will be making decisions without consulting that person. You understand? The head of your men's ministry is not a pastor, but has learned a lot from full gospel business men's fellowship and has brought the thing into the church and is organizing the men and putting the men well and is putting his money into the men's fellowship and is bringing his friends for the corporate world. Then you come and say, he doesn't respect us. He doesn't respect us. So I should go and call that person and tell him that I respect the pastors. Once you start demanding respect, you know you have failed. <laughs> you, you understand? Me, me, my senior pastor, my spiritual father never took me and put me before the church and said, respect this young guy. I was only 22 years old when I became a pastor. My shoe was like an Angola shoe. <laughs> the shoe that makes you become bow you know, you walk like this. One trouser, one trouser. Oh, some complete trouser. And all this place has torn. And the tailor, taking to tailors, and the tailor was tired. He said, no, no, no. This one. So I used to sit down like this. I cross my legs ah, in church. Hey, during those days, you don't know whether you, you are climbing the stage. People will see your back. So the way we used to climb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. His mercy is endured forever. You could feel some powerful men who were despising you. 
You could feel them, they were despising you. But still, your senior pastor will not touch them. All you know, so sometimes eh, all you have to do is look for those who have surgically positioned themselves around your senior pastor. And I become very powerful because, I mean, David became powerful around Saul. He was the one playing music anytime Saul went mad. You, you understand? He was the one playing it. So there was no way he was going to touch him. So there are people like that. All you have to do is connect to those people. So that's why I did with my spiritual father. I said, okay, let me prove that these guys, let me, let me, let me earn respect from these guys. Let me earn respect. What I did was that they used to complain about their pastor, uh, working habits. I changed. I was in church early morning. I was the youth pastor. Started bringing youth. Started preaching everywhere. Bringing youth into the church. Eventually, eventually, I went to chance on them having a meeting. And I was the topic. And their conclusion was that I was going to be one of the most successful pastors from the church. I earned their respect. Now when they meet me, they say, oh, Titi Ofe, we are not surprised, though. You were showing these signs when you were young. You are not surprised. You were showing these signs when you were young. Okay? So don't lamp up everybody and try to exercise your authority over everybody. Your authority must be measured. So lead from the center. Put some people at your right. Put some people at your left. Put some people in front of you. Put some people behind you. And all of them measure the way you exercise authority over them. If you reprove the pastor in the open, the other pastors will think you have betrayed them. If you don't rebuke them, this person also feels that, oh, Reverend Steve, so you sat down for this person to speak to me anyhow in the name of, the fa- of, a, of a pastor. You understand? Yeah. So at your level, you have to be strategic. You have to know the people who are the future of the church. Start investing in them. You have to know the people who are more or less like the ambassador of the church. There are some people, eh, the fact that their cars are outside your church, you attract certain class of people. There was a church, eh? and there was this old lady. During offering time, the old lady was always where she sat. They used to come from the back, and where she sat, she was always the first person to get up. And then, when they are coming, because she was an old lady, she was very close and slow. The church used to come to the pastor and say, this old lady delays offering time. Offering time, and then the way she was, can't we change where she sits? Oh, she's saying we should do. The pastor didn't mind anybody. One day there was a big meeting. People were raising it. Then the pastor said, what you have not noticed is that our church is located at a place where we cannot even put signboard. But what, how are we going to tell people that this is where our church is? It's a lungu lungu area. So we cannot even put a signboard anywhere for anybody to come. But this old lady is so popular in this village that if we say we go on crusade, how do we direct the people? We say, Antiochus Church. Antiochus Church. She has become the signboard to the church. So touch not the signboard. <laughs> there, was, there was a lady in the choir who sang discord. And the choir leader sacked him. The pastor went and said, no, put her in. So the choir leader of friend, they went to complain to people. But the lady was a good dancer. The pastor has heard from people. That Charlie, me bass all partners, her lady, you know. When they are, she's the only chorister who dances according to the song. <laughs> you get it? And it's a whole chorister. Look at you, know, if you people are some uncle for any, you know. Look at you. So, what I'm trying to say is that everybody is important. But the only way you can identify the importance is to make sure that there's a place for everybody and everybody has a place. And that your leadership abilities must reflect the way you recognize everybody and your leadership authority must not be full all the time. There are some people, you can deal with them with the fullness of your leadership authority. There are others, 50%. There are others, 25%. In fact, there are others, you go for negotiation. Are you here? You even notice that in David dared not touch some people in his kingdom. They were too powerful. And sometimes you can see, you can see the conflict map. That this man, if I touch him, he has a very influential wife in the women's fellowship. So when I touch him, his wife will be touched. And his wife's friends will be offended. And his wife's friends' friends will be offended. And the man himself, he has some friends in the church. They will also be offended. And their three children will all be drawn into this conflict. 
So let me tactically know how to deal with this person. I say sometimes there are some pillars, eh? Just decorate them and leave them. It will give you peace. Okay? So I'm teaching you the skills of the modern pastor. And this one, I'm teaching you how to manage people within your church. You remember what Paul wrote to his son, Timothy. He said, the young ladies in the church, treat them like sisters. The old men, treat them like fathers. The old women, treat them like mothers. The young men, like brothers. Paul was just teaching Timothy uh, uh, pastoral skills. And Paul could predict that 2022, I'll come and teach you the same thing. <laughs> On how to develop skills in relation to people. In relation to people. It's just like having children at home and you want to discipline them. The older the person, the bigger the kid. You, you, you get it? Fantastic. So are, are, we, are we level here? Yeah. Have you understood tactical positioning? Yeah. And today you are going to be tactical in your positioning. First, around your senior pastor and second, within the department or the branch where you find yourself. Okay? Good. Now, the organizational skills is the second skill every modern pastor must have. Getting things done efficiently. Getting things done efficiently. Getting things done efficiently is one of the major, major organizational skills that every pastor must have. You know how sometimes you say, oh, rest, even God rested. Even God rested. But I tell people that God finished creating the world. Before he rested. If you haven't gotten anything done, why are you resting? We are just in the second month of the year. You must have evidence of things that you are getting done. Some of you are still in the a holiday mode. Oh, you are only in February. By March, I'll take off. By, <laughs> by this thing, I'll do that. By this thing, I'll do that. You need to be able to develop an organizational skill, to organize yourself, organize people, organize your church. Listen, the first thing, person to organize, in order for you, I know that when it comes to agonizing, we are good. But when it comes to organizing, we are found wanting. So I want to suggest to you, the first person you must organize is you. Let me show you this. When you live here right now, you go to your room. See how you left your room before you came here. Where was your last belt you removed? This last singlet you took off, where did you put it? Your shoe, the one you wore last yesterday, where did you put it? You get it? Once you realize that the things around you are always disorganized, you must know that you have a very disorganized behavior. And it's going to affect other things. Charity begins at home. Your homework determines your office work. If you are not able to deal, not in school, one of the most efficient ways to be very good in school is that when you are given homework, you do it. The reason why the teacher gives you homework is he has just taught you something. Go home and do it. Every child that knows how to do homework is better in school. Okay? It's the same thing. Just see how you organize your life. And I'm going to show you how you organize your home. In fact, the queen of Sheba was amazed at how Solomon organized his home. It was on the basis of Solomon's organization at home that the queen of Sheba said those things about Solomon. Look at this. First Kings 10, 4 and 5. When the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he has built, the food on his table, the sitting of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his car bearers, and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. When you come to this church and you see the neatness, the excellence, the uniform dressing, the red tie, which is very obvious when you come here, the red tie, the white shirt, and the dark suit, all those guys that sit behind Reverend Steve. You, you understand? Recently, a friend of mine was with Reverend Steve and was coming to visit me. He was coming to visit me, and so he came to visit me, and we were chatting. 
I was just discussing with Steve and his excellence. I said, so even you go to his church, the protocol guys and the way they dress and everything, they are always in red, red tie and then dark suit, white shirt. He said, ah, is it one of them who drove me here? I said, yeah, you think he's going to work in a bank? That is a protocol officer. <laughs> And then when we got that, this was a guy who brought this thing and he sat down there smartly dressed. You, you get it? It is the reason why CEM is such a big thing in this country. The organizational capacity and the ability of the senior pastor, which starts from the branch he pastors. You understand? We start from when, when you when you see these things in your life, you can get bigger things done. You can get bigger things done. Sometimes you even your own personal life you can't organize. How can you organize a branch of the church? How can you organize? I say if you like, look at your bedroom when you get up. Look at how many days you have slept on your bed sheet. I am brown. You still can sleep on it comfortably. Oh yeah, yeah I'm telling you. You still can sleep on it comfortably and snore and dream. <laughs> it's the reason why anytime you dream, you're working on the baller. <laughs> because I always tell the young ladies in my church, if you go to a the man who wants to marry you, and the man always wants you to come and wash for him, clean for him, put his house in order, and all those things, note that you are entering into a very chaotic life. Start washing in. Maybe we'll be able to wash it. Also, also, it's not his life. He can't do it. So charity begins at home. If you want to get things done, want to get bigger things done, get the smaller things around you done. Discipline yourself. Get your prayer done every day. Get your Bible study done every day. Get the work of the ministry done every day. As you put all these things together, as you do these things together every day, they end up becoming something big later. Okay? Some time ago, some people came to me to interview me. And then they said, you got a place. They said, Bishop, can you tell us the secret of your success? Yeah. Then I tried to look for something to tell them. I wanted them to know that I'm a smart guy. I tried, sir, nothing was coming. So I actually asked them to please cut, cut, cut. Because it was pre-recorded. Let me think about something. What I was thinking about, the Lord said, is my grace and common sense principles. The everyday choices you make. When I sat down, I looked at it and said, yeah, having made any major, like some big bang theory thing, you know, like something just happened and I did something big and I became successful, no. It's the everyday ability to make the right choices, organize my life every day, every day, I mounted to that. And I remember I thought to hear how I walked out of poverty. I, gave, I developed my poverty exit plan. And I said to myself that in <laughs> my poverty exit plan, seven years. And I said to myself, if I work, so I said that, okay, if you work eight years every day, you work eight hours every day consistently for eight years, you become successful. Consistently for eight years, you become successful. So I said, I have seven years plan. So let me work 12 hours a day for seven years. And I developed my poverty as a plan. I called my wife. I showed my wife. I know you are tired. Give me seven years. I'll get you out of poverty. I showed her how it's going to go every year. How it's going to go. By the seventh year, we had a university. From, and when I was telling him, the church was in the wood. I was talking to her. The church was in the wooden structure. We were living in an uncompleted building. No water, no electricity, no toilet facility. But I did nothing extraordinary. The everyday choices that I made, 12 hours every day, I left home 7 a.m., came back home 7 p.m., consistently following up souls, running training programs, developing concepts, praying, fasting. I used to spend all my time at Achimota Forest. I didn't have an office. So I go to Achimota Forest early in the morning, start studying, start praying. By midday, I was going for evangelism. I come back home, go and do something. Then 7 o'clock, I end up in the house. Recently, I started bringing some people to the for what I was praying. And the Lord said, do the things you did at first. So I started bringing people to the Achimata Forest. I started telling them where I used to pray. The tree I used to sit on is still lying there. She said, I could spend hours sitting on this tree praying. The everyday things you do, taking one step at a time, 
will eventually result in something. So if you tell me the turning point, I can't tell you. If you tell me the one major decision I took that brought me to where I am now, I can't tell you. But what I know is that organize your life every day and eventually you will organize yourself. Okay? An organized pastor is an organized church. Hmm? Everywhere you see Reverend Steve, he's organized. You don't find confusion around him. You don't find he's looking for something. He cannot find it. And he, every day. The same excellence you see here, when you go to his house, you see the same excellence. Yeah. When it comes to meeting, you see the same excellence. Yeah. Wow. His ability to relate with people and put people together, organize people, it's amazing. Look at how he gets all of us to come to uh, rural, Christ to the Rural World Missions. How he gets all of us to come. His ability, that capacity to organize is crucial. And so when you are around him, eh, these are the things you should learn. Observe. Okay. Can we move on, Charles? Now, okay, so here are some few thoughts I want to give you in terms of how you can organize. Number one, task management. Arrange your tasks very well. Manage your assignment, the tasks that have been given to you. If you're a full-time pastor, keep this at the back of your mind. You are supposed to work eight hours a day on pastoring. If you are bivocational, keep this. Pastoring is not the other work. Your work is the other work. Pastoring is the main work. Are you here? To your work. Eight hours, commit to eight. One day I was just teaching some people on self-leadership. And I was just telling them that when I came to Sprinter Road, I was living on computer building. Nobody was interested in fathering me. Nobody was interested in overseeing me. For a number of years, I passed myself. I led myself. The best way to lead yourself astray is to lead others, not yourself. So take more time leading yourself. Okay, you don't need Reverend Steve to come to your branch and come and complain before you work. You don't need to come to synod every year to be motivated. And then when the motivation is gone, you leave it in the middle by around June. You don't do anything again. Unless you are supervised, unless you are compelled. In my office, I always know people who will, who will not survive, who will not. When, when I'm coming to your office and I see you closing your computer the interface, you are closing things because you're not doing my work, the work I'm paying you to do. You are not doing it. I know. And the reason why I know is that I'm smarter than you. I'm the one employing you. <laughs> you, you, you understand? So sometimes I'll call some of them to my office and say, sit down. I said, I'm older than you. I'm more educated than you. I'm more spiritual than you. What makes you think that you can outsmart me under this condition? You see the comparison I've made? They were so daddy, having I said, no, no, you have finished talking, go back. Go to your computer, do whatever you are doing. Next time I'm coming, don't close what you are doing, just keep doing it. Yeah. And once I've said that, that's not, I won't say anything again. Hey. Then you'll be there one day, you see everybody's rising, and you are behind. And then when you start complaining, I'll call you to my office again. They will go, we'll refer to that conversation. Yeah. And I'll give you the history. <laughs> I, are you here with me? Yeah. I, I, something I taught in church. The wise man's ladder to the top and the foolish man's ladder to the valley. And how people just walk themselves into valleys. Because if you don't supervise them, their work will not be done. Yeah. And they still feel that they should be paid for not doing any work. Yeah. Are you here? I used to belong to a church where the senior pastor was, in, was based in the UK. My senior colleague was always, we were all living in the same mission house. He was always in his room sleeping. I just said to myself, I, what kind of work is this? A work that there's no supervision. What you do is that Sunday you show up, you preach, and then from there, Wednesday you show up, you preach, Friday you go to prayer meeting, you pray, and then that's all. Then I started questioning myself, is that what people do to become successful? I said, no. 
There are too many spaces in my life at this stage. Let me find something. Let me occupy all the boredom in my life. Are you here? If we're a pastor and you are bored, it's because there's too many spaces in your life you are not occupying. Create jobs for yourself. Even if there are no job descriptions, create them for yourself. Give yourself job description. Look for the open space in the church and occupy and work. Lead yourself. Motivate yourself. And work. So the first thing is tax management. And the best way to manage your tax is you yourself creating. There's no job you are given to today that you cannot learn about those jobs on, the, on social media. I learned pastoring a challenge bookshop. Every money I had, I bought a book. Every money I had, I bought a book. I would challenge bookshop, buy books about pastoring, spiritual gifts, how to build teams, how to manage a church, how to do this. I'll buy them, read them, how to do evangelism, how to create evangelism school. By the age of 26, I was a principal of a Bible school. I have self-taught myself that I could become a principal of a Bible school and teach almost the whole <laughs> subjects in the Bible school. I'm telling you, self-leadership. Self-leadership. You see, it's, it's a sign that you can't lead, lead yourself. You know, sometimes eh, you must become a model that Rev. Re Steve can use. He should come to your church and see things you are doing and say that, you know something? You know something? Next year, say, Lord, I want you to come and teach the church what you are doing here. Come and teach the other pastors how we brought you to Fabrodebe to Michok. Without anything, and you have been able to build a chapel, you have been able to buy instruments, and in this village, you have been able to raise 100 people in this village, and you are bringing tight to the headquarters. You are a model pastor. You are a model pastor. Come and talk about how you have made things happen. If we make things happen for you, you are nobody. I'm telling you, you are nobody. You see why Ufriata is looking for e -Levy? Because we don't have money. As a country, we don't have money. We need to get money. We are broke. But if we like, let's have money. Put anybody on, you will leave this country. The reason why America, anybody can be president and the country will still stand. They are rich. The systems are in place. You, 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 you get it? So where you become successful, real success, comes from people like Obama who build themselves. They build themselves. So because you, before you can become president, you must show evidence of you having been able to become successful on yourself. So you can say anything about Barack Obama. He's not a Christian. He might even be a Muslim. He might even support gayism and other things. But there are some principles of success that even if unbelievers apply them in their work, they will still become successful. So all these things, you sitting down and looking at Bill Gates and looking at the Facebook founder and thinking that they are all Illuminati. They are all Illuminati. These people, they are Illuminati. That's why they are rich. Illuminati, if you like, eh, study their work habits. And put the same work habit in ministry, you become successful. Yeah. I'm telling you, the last time I was with Reverend uh, Eastwood Abbas conference, I was talking about work habits, and I was saying that, see, Reverend Eastwood is a pharmacist. If he hadn't become a pastor and used the same work habit with which he's doing ministry in a secular job, by now he would have owned a manufacturing pharmaceutical company. Yeah. I'm telling you. If Reverend Steve had not become a pastor, his work habit, whatever job he did, he would have become a, a big, successfully big in whatever he did. Your work habit is crucial for the success. When you are given a job, do it and do it and do it from the bottom of your heart and do it well. The Bible says, do everything without complaining. Do it from the bottom of your heart. What is the essence of we giving you everything before you start a church? I always tell my, my branch pastors, see, I came to Sprinters Road and I had nobody to give me salary, nobody to give me anything, and yet I built a church. 
I said, I want to put you in a branch. Have the same mindset. Pretend as if you have no headquarters. And you are just starting on your own. How will you start it? But if you look at me, then I can supply you. That is where you will falter. That is where you will not become successful. That's where you cannot become me. You cannot say that I like this bread, but I don't want it to be baked. It's not possible. The process the bread went through that you enjoy, you must go through the same process. My wife went to catering school and came to do some, came to bake some bread for me. It was very nice. When it came from the school, she just did the same measurement, everything measurement, and then gave it to me very nice. The next time she baked the bread for me, the taste was not the same. But I couldn't say it because she's my wife. <laughs> so I just eat it. So oh, man. I said, how is it? I said, oh, it's fine. It's very, very fine. And then after some few days later, I said, the last bread you did, how did you do that one? He said, oh. I didn't do exactly the same because I just thought that I should balance that. But then, yeah, they saw. Well, because you see, you cannot change the winning formula. You cannot change the winning strategy. What other people have done? I mean, listen, you don't have to go anywhere to see how to build a successful church. Just sit down and study your pastor. Finish. The man is organizing synod for his pastor. He's sitting through, listening, and learning. Sitting through, listening. When I go to any of his conferences, no matter how difficult the conference is, day and night, he will still come and sit down and listen and go through everything all of you are going through. But you will bring somebody to your branch to come and train your leaders. While the person is talking, you are in your office. You can never become like him. You cannot. Are we here? Yeah. If you're understanding me, say amen. Yeah. The next thing is time management. We have to understand that there are three lines, there are three lines in ministry. Timelines, deadlines, and lifelines. And you need to understand it. You see, timelines are seasons in your life where you need to have certain notable achievement noted down. Okay, I'm a pastor for 10 years, but nothing to show. Still struggling with that branch and complaining. You are missing your timelines. I'm a pastor for 15 years, nothing to show. I've been given a branch for five years, nothing to show. Nothing to show. I'm just sharing with you the seven years and how I transformed my life. It's a timeline. Okay, and I don't make the timeline. So you, you need to have some timelines and say, within this period, I should be able to do some things. Okay, and there are also deadlines in ministry. There are some things that if you are not able to achieve it in the first 10 years of your ministry, you will struggle to do them. Reverend Steve is now 60. He knows that the, the freedom his body gave him when he was 30 years, his body is not giving him the same freedom at this time. But then you could go back and say, wow, if I had not done these things when I was young, I would not have been able to do it now. Yeah. Are you here? So every single time you are wasting is going to affect you in the future. It's going to affect you in the future. So be very careful. So you have deadlines, they will come. And then you realize that I should have done this long ago. Some of you, God was calling you long ago. You didn't respond. You are not responding. And now there are young guys who have come, eh? The way they preach. And how they scream. You know, our, 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 we, we are noisy people. Africans, we are noisy people. So when you are preaching cool sermons, people don't like it. There are young guys who have come. Yeah! People, yeah! yeah! Oh! They can do this for two hours. And the young people love it. 
And then now you are in your 50s. You also go and say, yeah. <laughs> and it's not coming. Whoa, it's not coming. <laughs> the boys are looking at you and say, nah, now so for no ye. And fuck. Because you should have been doing that long ago. Now you want to employ young people to do what you should have done. And the thing is not working. Because you see, if you employ young people to do what you should have done, you are teaching them that this is what I did. But if you haven't done it before, you employ them, they still can't do it. So you are always offended. You have employed them all. And you feel they are not meeting your standard. Where are the souls? I'm paying you people. You are not bringing the souls to church. Where are the souls? I'm paying you people. But you should know, if you have done it before, you will know that it takes a long time for souls to start manifesting. <laughs> But because you haven't done it before, you think you have put some five guys together and you, are, you have money, so you are paying them 2,000, 2,000, 2,000. And you think that that 10,000 must have given, should have given you some, some souls by now. And they are not giving the souls. And you are offended. You are angry. You want to fight. You want to create problems. They won't mind you. They'll be laughing at you. When you go, they'll laugh. So don't come to that point where your time is past and you are trying to live in the past. Do it now. But however, that's what we call lifelines. So that God looks at your, your genuine heart and he gives you a second time chance. And you must utilize it and use it and use it very, very well. Are you here with me? Do you understand what I'm teaching you? I've been there before and I know these things. I've met people who feel that they have wasted their time. The last time I was here, I asked the question, what are you doing now? What are you doing today? You are either doing yesterday's things today, you are alive, you are late, or doing today's things today, you are on time, or doing tomorrow's things today, you are ahead of time. It's those who are ahead of time who succeed in ministry. Do tomorrow's things today. Okay? And then team management, probably if we get there, I'll talk about it. Team management had to Build a solid team. Your ability to be able to gather people to do the work. Organize them. It's the assembling of skills. Identify the people who can do the work. Put them together. And let them help you. Jesus was good in building teams. I'm sure that when people saw the people he was gathering, they were wondering, and this rabbi there, he lies only on school people. But look at how he transformed those people. Look at how you transform those people. One of the things you must be able to do as a leader is your ability to identify high potential people and develop them into a winning team, efficient team, and use them. So when you leave this, one of the assignments I'm giving you is to go sit down, look at your, and commit yourself to developing leaders. I know one pastor who is very successful in this country, and one of his pastors was telling me that at one point, for about nine years in his life, he never accepted outside appointment. He just focused on developing leaders, speaking to his church members, and preaching a particular line of message, and eventually worked for him. You are in a branch. Your branch is just 50. And you always have preaching appointment. You always have preaching appointment. There is no focus, no concentration. Oh, Reverend Steve is traveling, so we too we can travel. And then you travel, then you travel. Look at what Reverend Steve has done. Now this, you see, at some point in your life, you build a dream. At some point in your life, the dream builds you. You see, some people who are building dreams want to behave like people whose dreams are building them. At this stage, Reverend Steve is not building CEM. CEM is building him. His legacy is opening doors for him. He sits with certain people because of what he has done with CEM. So CEM is now giving him legitimacy. You understand? So he can decide to travel for one month and CEM will still be alive. Because people's loyalty is to this organization now. So CEM will still be here. You have 50 people and the bishop has traveled, so you also travel. By the time you come back, you have 50 has left with 25. And the way you struggled before you got that 60, I was here landing two weeks and now one month. Well, yes, KB also. And because you have no legitimacy, who will invite you? You go and struggle for pop it here, pop it here, pop it here, pop it here. Whoever can now take it to crowded toy, you, you might not get it. So focus on the work that I've been giving you and do it. Do it well. 
at the end of the day, if you eventually move on from CM to another place, do you know what you have done? You have built capacity for your next level. Okay? And then trend management. Look at the modern things that are taking place. The modern things that are taking place and utilize them. Oh, I pitied pastors who spoke against Facebook when we went, when we, the churches were locked down. Now they didn't have Facebook skills. They had no social media skills. In fact, some were calling my team to help them. Oh, Charlie, meet my boy now. Your Facebook, you see a DB, you see a bad Facebook. Some of them, when you even help them, that use your phone to do it, they turn the phone upside down. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 you say. Uh, mommy and mom pie. <laughs> Are you here? Well, it's yes, 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 I'm telling you, this is like your smartphone. With that your smartphone, you are a young pastor, you have the energy, you have any, any, anything, if you like, start praying at a certain time, every day for the next one year, you start having people who will join you in praying. So that other who comment you on people's posts, people put in there, then you comment, and then you argue with people, and then you insult people, and then you get yourself in politics. You put one transaction near me, cause you na near chairman want to make near a good job, can near you good, near you good. I'm a pastor here. We be here. Good morning, Ghana. No, I'm going to share. Oh, good evening. What share? Good morning, Ghana. What share? Midday news. What share? We now to one on nine. That phone you have. That smartphone you have, if you are smarter than that phone, only that phone is smarter than you. For that, that phone is an opportunity to grow your ministry. Over 2 billion people are on Facebook. And a lot of them are Ghanaians. And they're the young people you are looking for to build your church. Use it. And use it efficiently and effectively. You are doing something in your church. They even post it there. And you don't. You don't comment. You don't even know. You can't share it. And it's there. Listen, digital evangelism is not one of the major tools. I went to see one of the fathers in this land. He's doing a new church. When I went there, he's just building a whole digital center. And why are you investing into this thing? You say, after COVID, after COVID, Digital evangelism is the main thing, and I'm doing huge investment. I say it's even going to get worse. It's even going to, I mean, at times it's going to come, people will not come to church. They will stay at home and listen. I'm sure that there are more people watching us on social media now than those of us sitting here. You, you understand? Some of the big opportunities I've gotten outside this country, people just watch me on social media and say, God, this guy, we need him. He has to come in. You understand? Start a devotion. Every day, 5 to 6 a.m., 5 to 6 a.m., if I'm not a lazy person, 5 to 6 a.m., do it for one year. The first day, two people will come. Don't worry. I should keep going. We will be three months. No, you probably have 40. Be no more share. We have 20, 40, 20, 40. But it is your prayer meeting you are recording. So why are you discouraged? Whether people watch or not, you will still pray. And do it well. Do it well, do it well, do it well. The time you realized, it has got momentum and it's moving. One of my branch pastors, his branch is growing. Because everything I put there, he will post it and write under it, the son of Bishop Titi Ofer. The son of Bishop Titi Ofer. And then add his church direction and other things to it. People will now walk to his church and say, ah, your father is Bishop Titi. I saw your post and I came. People will call me, oh, you have a son somewhere there. I'm going to his church. I'm going to the... Reverend Steve is big on social media. Use it. It will help you. Okay? Now you, you, you see the way this church is built and look at the curtains, look at the, com the comfortable ambience in which you are learning. It is the modern church. So the Tarawana here and the air conditioner, I saw the air conditioning, same with the air conditioning. When you come to a place like this, lie on the altar and pray. The Lord give me this grace. You know why? Most people who come to our churches, 
drive air conditioned cars, go to air conditioned offices, and sleep in air conditioned bedrooms. It's not that three hours on Sunday that they will suffer in your heat. They are not used to it. Their children cannot even go to children's service without air condition. You get it? So it is the modern church. So you can take advantage of modernity without losing your originality. You can be a first century church in the 21st century. You, 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 you get it? You understand it? Fantastic. There are people in Nigeria building 100,000 city auditoriums, air conditioned, and they are growing. And they are growing, they are expanding, they are growing. Invest in yourself as well. As a pastor, appear well. Now, pastors have become symbols of dignity and honor for people. There are people in my church, when they go somewhere and they say, oh, Bishop Titi Ofe is my pastor, he opened doors for them. Open doors for them. One of my pastors was going to marry a very well educated young lady. When he, the landlady went to introduce the guy to their father, the father said, No. Ah, what's up for small boy? No, 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 I won't agree. So the guy came to them, he was worried. I said, Do tell him you are passing my branch. He said, Oh, that's a mistake I made. I said, Go back, tell him you are passing my branch. <laughs> went back to visit the man again and so I I'm a I'm Bishop T of first son, I'm the pastor in his branch. He said, Eh? Are you sure? So if you like, I can call him right now. So he called me, I spoke with the man. That was how he got the girl to marry. <laughs> you, 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 you understand? I have some Niger- Nigerians in my church. Sometimes, you know, they go somewhere and people want to doubt them. So, Bishop is my, I'll, I'll call him right now. They call Daddy, please speak to someone for me. And then I take their phone, I speak. People want you to become a symbol for them. Build yourself. Develop yourself. Create avenues for yourself. Be strategic about who you want to become. And be intentional. Be intentional. Things, things did not happen to us, but we happened to things. And you have to learn those things. And then trust management. One of the key things you must learn to do in ministry is how to manage the trust people put in you. Okay? Make sure that people are not disappointed. Your public appearance should be the same as your private life. Okay? I am telling you. One night there was a rumor about a pastor. And my wife, I went to see my wife praying and crying. And then I said, Andy, what is happening? He said, I'm praying for this pastor. I just read this about him. On the, and I'm praying that it shouldn't be true. It shouldn't be true because, honey, if this is true, can you imagine how many people will leave the kingdom? He's too big. He has too much influence. It shouldn't be true. It shouldn't be true. And she was crying, you know. It shouldn't be true. My, my wife is more Christian than the Pope. She, she, I, I, I call her sister of spirit. And she was praying. So I left her, locked the door. I said, cry on somebody's husband. You, you cry, pray. And she came up. Fortunately, the case died. It wasn't true. See, honey, can you imagine how it would have affected people? So you can imagine, you see? People, the people, want, you have to come there. You have to become a man of influence, a woman of influence. But you have to build it. Build it and come to that place where people can trust you. That's why sometimes eh, I advise a lot of young pastors that if you are in a place like CEM, don't go and start your own church. Because you will start your church, it will take you 10 years for people to trust you. When I came to Sprinters Road, young boy in that building, it took years. You go for evangelism. People who now open their doors and want me to come to their house and that you haven't visited me. They used to open their gates like this and stand outside with me. Uh-huh. What do you want? I saw my name is Gideon Titi Affair. I just started the church here. I want you. Okay, okay, no problem. Give you the, and they will close. There was no trust. It took a long time. If I had gone to Sprinters Road with ICGC, Ashen, CEM, I would have been 20 times better. But it took me the first 10 years to establish credibility. You get it? To establish credibility. There was a guy in our church. When you give him a chance to lead prayer meeting, you can't stand there. We are not seeing miracles. The dead must be raised. The cripples must walk. Let's pray. Let's pray. We must see this in this church. You must see this in this church. One day I called him and said, you know something? You want to see the dead raised, cripples walk? Why don't you start your church? 
and raise the dead and let the cripples walk. I'm still building my capacity to raise the dead. But it looks like he's frustrating you. He left the church to start a new church. It's been over eight years now. I'm still waiting for that cripple to walk. <laughs> the cripple is not working. And he's locked up in a very small place. Yeah. I say, sometimes I can see him on Facebook. I call him, this boy will die. Oh. This boy will die. He's going to kill himself. <laughs> oh, he will go and wear something like a bishop, make himself like this. Praise the Lord. I say, look at him. <laughs> And then your threat management is very crucial. Let me tell you this. See, we're all born with some natural tendencies. Some people are talkative. Some people are quick-tempered. Some people have, I mean, different things in us. There is nothing bad about who you are. It is, when it goes through a situation and it comes out, how it comes out. You see, somebody's a talkative but makes money talking. Somebody's a talkative, gets problem gossiping. They all talk. One talk about ideas, one talk about people. So talking itself, being a talkative itself is not a problem. Recently I did a conference on Facebook called Talkpreneurship. Worship. You watch it, eh? Talkpreneurship. Worship, how to build a public speaking business. And my argument is that I was born a talkative and I've decided to use my talking to build a public speaking business. And it's working. I'm hosting General Petraeus, former CIA director. I'm holding him on a webinar in April on strategic leadership. The man is charging me big to just show up on the continent of Africa on social media for one hour. He's making money just talking. And even when he quoted the figure, I said, no, this one is Africa. I say it's 120th. Because it's Africa, I've divided it into 20, and I've given you one. <laughs> oh, yeah, take it or leave it. I was getting one of the first ministers of one of the, um, uh, from Scotland, to also speak, a lady. It was first minister, means former prime minister. The amount of money she quoted. So I said, you know something, I have a women's conference coming, I'll call you on that one. <laughs> and these are talkatives who have converted their experience and they are talking into knowledge, and they are talking. So everybody has a certain trait, you see, and your strength is managing that thing very well. God will always build a ministry around your personality. I'm telling you. And God deliberately put all those things, the traits in you, God put them in you for the purpose of your assignment. For the purpose of your assignment. There is no better person anywhere than you. All you need to do is that train that trait in you. Train it, develop it, control it, and let it come out well. Yeah. And you see how far God will take you. One of my pastors in church, people came to me and said, he's very quick-tempered. The way he can act and react, I called him one day. I said, you know, don't stop being quick-tempered. It's a powerful tool. But don't direct it on people. Direct it on things. That is, look for, don't look for who is wrong. Look for what is wrong. Why is this thing not working? Not why are people not working. Why are these things not working? And attack the things that are causing the people to be. And now he's one of the darling pastors in the church. He will come to daddy. The things that I used to fight over. Now I laugh over it. Now I laugh over it. And his anger is directed at putting things together. When you see him, we are organizing conference and things are not going well. The way he's going about and he's angry, go and put things and put this here and get this done. And formally, we'll fight with people. Are you here with me? Yeah. So don't, don't wish to be someone else. You might not be a charismatic person who stands out there and speaks and people stand up and they clap their hands. Don't want to be like that. You speak slowly. Listen, some people's personality may be very, very attractive and very open. Don't try to be like them. What will let people like you is what God has given you. Build on it, develop on it, and build. Listen, when I go to the Bible, there are only few things I see is leadership. That these things I'm teaching you. There are, when Reverend Steve goes through the Bible, he will see different than what I'm seeing. He will see rural missions. I will see leadership. 
You, you, you understand? And that is, the, that is how God has made all of us. When Papa goes to the Bible, he sees warfare. Yeah. Yeah. When Otabel goes there, he sees success and leadership. You can compare the two men. All the people who go to action like the way Papa interprets the scriptures. That's why they are there. They are there in their thousands. Action can finish 40 days fast today. And Papa goes to sleep and wakes up and feels like next week we should do 21 days. And so people will be dead and they will be full. You, you, you get it? People will be dead and they will be full. Because the people there believe that they will survive by prayer, by warfare. So they are there. There are others. I'm sure that if the Otabel organizes prayer conference, it will not be as big as Papa running the prayer conference. In the same way, if Papa organizes a motivational leadership, they say it will not be as big as the Totabel organizes. Yeah. Because the people in the Totabel church are there because of his unique calling and ministry. Yeah. 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 You see, where competition begins is when you start comparing yourself to people. So God has brought you into this family with a certain uniqueness. Develop it, build it, and eventually it will show. Amen. Amen. Eventually it will show. So let me deal with one more and then I will be off from here. The next skill I believe every pastor must have is relational skills. Relational skills. Your ability to build relationships. Sometimes when we're having some discussions and uh, somebody has to be caught, a receiver will always say, okay, leave me, I'll call him. I'll call him. He has relationship with almost everybody. Solid relationship for your this contemporaries over the years. Wow. One of the things that actually I made me stay in NAC and I enjoyed working for NAC is because of Reverend Steve. You know, his encouragement, his ability to reach out to you. If he doesn't understand something, how he will call you to get it. His that capacity is very crucial. And it's something all of you must learn. Yeah. Yeah. Relational skills. skills. Look at this. Two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. If, I, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend them. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This is a whole powerful relational teaching. How to build your network, how to build your social capital, how to get the people you need to move on. So here are four P's that you must look out for in every relationship that will help you. Four important P's that you must look for, out for in every relationship that must help you. Number one, profits. Two are better than one because they have good returns for their labor. If the relationship will not make you better, don't get into it. it must, you must have certain profits from that relationship. Two, promotion. If one falls down, the other will lift him up. The other will lift him up. Three, power. If two lie down together, they keep each other warm. That is empowerment. And four, protection. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. So you must see these four pieces in every relationship. And the pastor must learn how to build solid social capital. Okay? Seven years to the time we had, a, we had a university. I knew I was going to have a university seven years' time. I started building a relationship with some professors. Every Christmas, I'll send them gifts. On their birthdays, I'll send them gifts. They were there one day. I said, I need people to help me start a university. They all made themselves available. I had already built my social capital. I already built my social capital. So learn. You come here, you are here, you are all pastors in the same church. You must try to introduce yourself and get to know everybody. Okay? 
get to know everybody, get to connect yourself. There is one pastor who has bought new equipment and the old one doesn't know what to use it for. And it's kept it somewhere. And people are saying, what do you do with it? Keep it, keep it. And you are looking for money to buy new equipment. You can get it here. Don't walk alone. Build close relationships. Okay? The community where you are and pastoring the church, get to know other pastors there. Meet together. Pray together. Get yourself together. Okay? It's very important. Okay? So, please go to the next slide. Good. Now, oratorical skills. Language is the means of getting an idea from my brain into yours without surgery. One Mark Amidon said this. So I'm talk, as I'm talking to you now, I'm getting ideas from my brain into yours without surgery. You understand? And I'm choosing my language. I'm choosing how to communicate this efficiently and effectively. I'm looking at this as not preaching. It's a pastor's seminar. I must have a posture that is seminary. You understand? Yeah. And, and to present it. I must choose my language well for you to get it. Now, every pastor must have the capacity to be, to be an oratorical leader. You should be able to speak what God has played in your hands. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean that you are speaking by shouting, but your ability to communicate it and communicate it efficiently and very well. Now, it's not everybody who is a natural speaker, but you can learn to speak. When I married my wife, she, she, her own was prayer. She wouldn't talk. Very quiet. And her own was prayer every time she was praying. But today, she talks more than me. When she's going to preach, I say, Chale, you have 45 minutes. Oh, 45 minutes, they answer me. And I say, some time ago, even to give an exhortation for 10 minutes, you'll be complaining. But see, she's built her oratorical skills. And now she can stand and develop and speak. So I want to show you a few things. So, language is the means of getting an idea from ability. Now, look at this. As 7.22, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Why, why, why is Moses powerful in speech and action here? Powerful in speech. Wasn't the same guy who said he was a stammerer? So how did he get here? He learned how to communicate. He learned how to speak. The Egyptians educated him. <laughs> Are you here? He became powerful in speech. So you can learn how to speak. If you go to my website, and my, my Facebook wall, and look for a top print worship, you'll find some of my teachings on public speaking. The 21 laws of effective public speaking, you'll find it there. How to build a public speaking career, you'll find it there. If you, if you, you are talkative, you have a good mind. Use it. Learn, develop yourself, and use it. You'll be fine. Are you here? Fantastic. So, next, so now, this is what leaders do. Let's use language to do. Number one, to inform. Number one, to inform. Now, do you know that some certain people in our churches, the last 20 years, they haven't gone to any school, they haven't gone to any, this thing, any seminar. The only place they get information to make decisions is from the puppet. That's why you must learn well and communicate effectively what you have learned. Okay? Anytime you are going to a puppet and you have a sermon, note that people will make decisions based on this sermon I'm going to preach. Will it work? Does it work? When I read Charles Finney's theology, the key thing that really stood out for me, he said, your sermon must be true to scripture, true to life, and true to reason. True to scripture, if a theologian takes your sermon, he should be able to pass it. True to life, if an Hausa Koko seller comes to church on Sunday, you should have ideas that will transform her business in the morning, on Monday morning. True to reason, if a philosopher takes your message to analyze it, it must make sense. So even though you speak to inform, you must make sure you are well informed. Okay? Number two, for instructions. You must have that capacity to instruct people and people must understand what you are communicating. 
One of the things that will cost you a lot is to tell people to do things and then they do the opposite because you are not instructing efficiently. And then, number three, to share ideas. Anytime you have an idea, you must share those ideas. The former CEO of Coca-Cola company once said that it is useless to have an idea in your brain if you cannot communicate it. Because the idea that you cannot communicate will never outgrow the brain cell is occupying. Okay? So sometimes when you are here like this, uh, your man of God has brought you here, your pastor has brought you here to share ideas with you. That's why there's a team to it. And it brings men that can communicate those ideas yeah. to you. Okay? And then, influence you use to inspire. So sometimes you speak because you want to inspire people. People hear you and you inspire them, you edge them on, you push them hard to go on. And then finally, to influence people. Five eyes. Why you should improve on your rhetorical skills. Amen. And then number five is thinking skills. Thinking skills. Thinking skills. Thinking is using your mind to solve problems. Worrying is using your mind to magnify problems. So you are either thinking or you are worrying. You know what consultants do? They think for those who worry and charges them for worrying. So worrying is expensive, isn't it? So when you come to a craft business school, what, do you know what I do? I think for people, and they pay me for thinking for them. Come, coming weekend, we are launching the Restam MBAs from Restam Glendore University. I just brought an, a new MBA into the country. And last, last weekend, the people came for orientation, and my staff came to me and said, hey, there's a big people, there's a pilot in it, there is a, a, a member of parliament in it, there's an ambassador who came, there is this thing who came. I said, but what, what were you thinking? I was thinking for them. I, I came to that pro program, and the space is charging dollars. I just felt that there are some people in the system who don't like Ghanaian qualification. They want, they, want, they want to get a foreign qualification in Ghana and go and graduate there. So I thought for them. So now they are buying my thinking. Okay? And I'm charging them well in dollars. Because I'm not only selling a product, I'm also selling dignity. I'm selling ego. So when they came, I said, take them to one of the nicest lecture halls. Just keep them there. Let them enjoy themselves. Get one of the white people to speak through electronic media to them. Let them see the face of a white man. They will pay for all. Just thinking for them. But you see, on the more important note, bringing it into the pastoral destiny, your church members expect you to be a pastor who thinks, not a pastor who worries. The day Joseph thought for Pharaoh was the day that he got his promotion. Think for Reverend Steve. You, 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 you put your different platforms. Yeah. Once he sees you a smart person, he sees you a smart person. The preachings he cannot go and do, he will call you. Can you go and do it for me? Yeah. Can you go and he will trust you yeah. and let you go. Solve problems. Be a man in the church that solves problems. Don't be the one that complains about problems. Be the one that solves problems. Are you here? Yeah. So what, all I do is I solve problems and I get paid for solving problems. I just get paid for solving problems. You haven't seen our new towers issue. I should bring you around to look at it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just, all I do is to think for people. They pay me, I build facilities. <laughs> life is fun, oh, and life is easy. You think for people, they pay you. You just use it to build facilities. That is all. That is all. I can imagine that 20 years ago, I was in an uncompleted building on the Sprinters Road. Now I live on the tallest building on the Sprinters Road. My, my prayer chamber is the tallest on the Sprinters Road. So I go to sleep there, and when I'm sleeping too, I open all the curtains so I can see the stars. Got my bread. <laughs> and then I see the stars, and I'm looking at the stars. Yeah, you've been there, you've seen the facility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just finished there. Yeah. So I'll be just there, looking at the stars, all thinking. Just thinking for people, solving problems. 
everyday problems. And no, when you're a smart pastor, ah, pastor, eh, the way he thinks, eh, the way he talks, we have a lawyer in a uh, young lady who is just qualified to be a lawyer, works in this powerful law firm. The one day he came and said, Daddy, hmm, hmm. When I was talk, just talking, somebody said, Where do you go to church? And then so I go to Pleasant Place Church. Pleasant Place, oh, Bishop Titi of it. No wonder. No wonder. That's the way you talk and think like that. No wonder. I said, Okay, pay me a um, copyright fee. You are copying my ideas. You, you understand? So think. And one way in which you can get your brain to think is to exercise it. Read more. Read more. Read and pray more. Read and pray. It will help you as a pastor. Solutions are key to your success in ministry. As you read. So let me conclude the whole thing with just um, some ideas, some ways in which you think. One is called creative thinking. Creative thinking. I was just um, talking to um, Pastor Elijah, who was just telling me about the facilities here, where the Ghana Church is, where the Ewe Church is, where there are all those things, the chapel where he was telling me. And it's, it's, a, it's a novelty. So one facility and different chapels. And people really love to hear their own language being preached to them. Yeah. And you can see it will bring this explosion of growth. Yeah. So you come to the same facility. And every people are just everywhere hearing their language. Yeah. It's called creative thinking. I hear original ideas. So I'm going to copy it. I'm also going to build different things. <laughs> <laughs> Are you here? Uh, I pay copyright fee. <laughs> I pay copyright fee. I, I, and look at the way the facility has been used. Look at, look at how somebody can get twice this land and cannot do these things that is done here. It shows a leader who thinks, a leader who brings work. And then strategic thinking, this thinking is more into the future. I'm sure that Reverend Steve is predicting when he will be 70 yeah. and where he wants to be and where he wants this church to be. So sometimes he'll be doing a lot of strategic thinking. He'll be looking into the future and be yeah. making future projections. Yeah. And then competitive thinking. Competitive thinking. In church, it's difficult to teach competitive thinking, but. Don't forget that the same souls you are looking for, another church is looking for that soul. Yeah. That's why sometimes you hear one church is organizing some service that the service is really working and growing, and your church members are going there. Yeah. You start that service too. Put yeah. a deliverance service. I mean, it's called competitive thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's common sense. Yeah. Somebody say, ah, now we'll be, we are fenu, a deliverance means into a deliverance, but your church members is going there. I just realized that your church members have need of deliverance. So you also go and look for a deliverance minister. You hire him and create a deliverance service for him. What do you want to say? Get out, get out, come out in Jesus' name. And you keep the person, he's there, you do come out, come out. You keep your church members. It's called competitive thinking. And then it's what we call revolutionary thinking. This is where you do out of the boss pastoring. Out of the boss pastoring. You understand that? Sometimes when you look at Lakewood Church, they are some kind of out of the box church. Yeah. You see, Joel, Joel Austin is not a regular church a pastor. Yeah. That's things. So our church attracts young corporate people because I try to be a bit revolutionary in my pastoring. Yeah. Yeah. And then the evolutionary thinker, the evolutionary thinker, give him a small branch with five people. In five years, he will change everything. They can see a forest in a seed. Then finally, epiphanic thinking. This is where I'm, I'm good. When you pray, God speaks to you. It's called divine ideas, where God will give you powerful divine ideas. So I'll end here. We're going to pray that, Father, give us divine ideas for effective and efficient ministry. And God can give you. I hope it's been a blessing to you. God bless you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Rise on your feet and begin to pray. Ask the Lord, the Father, speak to me. Just touch me and give me that divine idea. Lift up your voice and pray.
lift up your voice pray for strong and efficient divine ideas just lift up your voice and pray just lift up your voice talk to the Lord break the door set the break down the door set the break down the door speak to me O Lord in the name of the Lord Jesus but no set the break down the door set the door set the break down the door set 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 Let them that that run that ya ya to your God break pan ta ya let them ya do shut up and ya ta let them that ya ya break pan do shut up and that ya ya do shut up and that ya ya break pan do shut up and that ya the grace of the Lord to give up our skills in the name of the Lord Jesus right now O Lord in Jesus name and that the red up ya break pan do shut up and go pala ba ga ya do shut up and that let them do shut up and that Yet let them recap those that let them recap. Recap that that transition. Recap that that there. Yet those shall not pass that path. Recap that yet. Yet that the Lord will not pass. Yet those shall 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 not pass. Lift up your voice. Let God give your mind a touch right now. Divine ideas. Divine ideas. Epiphanic ideas. We speak that upon you right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Allah ba 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 ya, lay man giri mi handa ya. Allah ba 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 ya, lay ba 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 ya, ayan giri mi kata ya. Allah ba 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 ya, ban giri mi kaya wa ba. Allah ba 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 ya, zanda la ba ba ya. Allah ba 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 zala ba ba ya. Allah ban giri mi kaya. Allah ban zala ba zanda la ba ba ya. Allah ban giri mi kaya. Allah ba 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 ya. Alei ba 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 zili mi handa ya. Alei ba 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 shanda la ba ya. Alei ba 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 ya. Man zili mi handa ya ba ba ya. Ya la ba 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 ya. Alei ba shala ba ba ya. Alei ba 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 ya. Man zili mi kaya ba ba ya. Alei ba zili mi handa ya. Alei ba 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 ya. Alei ba 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 ya ba ya. Alei ba shala ba ba ya. Alei ba ba shaya. Alei mandala ba ba ya, alei ba ya la ya, kazu mandala ba ba ya, alei ba ya ba ba ya, alei ba zaya ma ya, alei ba la ba ba ya, alei ba zaya ka ya, alei ba la ba ba ya, alei ba ba ya, alei mandala kala ba ba ya, aye ba 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 ya, alei ba 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 ya, alei ba 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 ya, alei ba ya da ya, kala ba shaya ma, alei ba la ba ba ya. Lift up your hands, Jesus. Father, we pray for integrity of heart. Yes, Lord. But we also pray for skillful hands, Lord. Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that this year as we we pursue excellence, Jesus, that you will give us integrity of heart and skillful hands, Lord. Yes, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that touch our reasoning and thinking faculties. Yes, Lord. And help us, Lord, to think deeper. Help us, Lord, to become solution providers, Lord. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for having me, Reverend Steve. Thank you so much. Wow, 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 wow. Are you clapping or are you not clapping? What a teaching, what a revelation, what deep depths of knowledge. That's one thing I love about uh, 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 Fair. He comes, every time he comes with fresh oil, fresh revelations. 
he wraps his mind around the scriptures and uses it in the corporate world and also for ministers. Have you been blessed today? Yes. Too powerful. I'm going to allow five questions on some of the things he has taught so that he can respond to them because I think some of you have one or two questions. So we can walk to one of the microphones here and then we just want to spend about five minutes or ten minutes just ask a question on your mind of the, some of the things. If I want to go back to some of the things he has said, I will end up also preaching another sermon. Because I have a lot to say on every point that he raised today. Very, very powerful, very informative. And some of the things that I am doing, I didn't know that I was fulfilling a certain, uh, I was fulfilling a certain vacuum that he has created in his teaching. It's like I'm doing something he's teaching on. Say amen. Or he's using something I'm doing to also teach. Yeah. And I'm very, 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 very happy to see that. Oh, okay, so we are on track. Then I, I try to listen to the things and see which of the gaps are left in my ministry. So I put myself there. Say amen. So I pray that the networking, the oratorial skills, the team, and all the points he has raised, Please go over this uh, this uh, teaching again hey, on your you. own for another two hours when you are relaxed. And here it again is on YouTube, it's on CMTV Live. You can always go back and listen to it and be blessed some more. So five quick uh, questions. Make your questions very short. Don't ask another question. Yes, please come. Don't ask Senior Minister. Give it up for Senior Minister. Thank you so much for a very refreshing teaching. But uh, I want you to throw some more light on the aspect where you said, because we have unique talents, there must not be competition. And at the same time, we must have competitive thinking. So if you can throw some more light on that. Thank you, sir. So internal competition is more destructive than external competition. So there are situations where competition is used advisedly because it is to motivate you to move on. So I gave a very good example. So I gave different examples. So within internal competition, just celebrate your uniqueness so that yeah. you don't compare yourself to somebody and compete with the person. But within the standard competition, look at what other people who are doing what you are doing are doing and the edge they are having over you and make sure that you can close that gap and move on. Other than that, most churches will not be building the kind of buildings that we're having now. When all churches were in classroom, everybody was comfortable. Yeah. But when people started moving from classroom, people started moving from classrooms too. So they have a form of competition. When people started putting air conditioners, you also have to put in an air condition mm -hmm. to keep some people. When people move, moved on TV, you also feel that you have to be visible. So you moved on, on to TV. As, as well. Recently, we relocated our main chapel to the roadside because we wanted visibility. Because there are more churches coming on the Sprinters Road and they are buying facilities by the roadside and they are becoming very visible. So you also feel, let me also be visible. So they are strategic competition. Blessings. <laughs> Blessings. Okay. Second one. Second one. Or is all cray? <laughs> Anybody has, or you want a contribution, want to say something? All right. What do we say to the man of God? God bless you. And uh, you are booked for next year. You see, it's on, your your invite, invite is on autopilot. <laughs> to Jesus comes. Say amen. I love listening to him, and I love the way he teaches. And every time I meet him, he's doing something new. Every time, and that's one of the things I love about ministry. You must always be bringing out new things to to grow your ministry, to grow your life, and also to lead yourself. And so, and, and, and any time I hear his testimony, I'm blessed because 20 years ago, some Fintech Road they didn't have the chain and everything. And when you go to his facility now, you see all kinds of programs and projects, and how he's thinking for people developing MBAs and training and bringing others I have a friend, Victor Se, Bishop Bishop, his two daughters are in a school, you know, and I, and I feel that 
uh, he has been able to charter a certain path and he's carrying the body of Christ along and he's, he's teaching what he's doing. He's not, he hasn't cocooned himself and selfishly enjoy what he's doing, but he's teaching it. He's exposing what he's doing. He's laid the, the pathway of his success, how he, got, how he developed a seven-year plan to get himself out of poverty. All these things is to inspire you also to see how you can use some of his life experiences, his teaching, his educational abilities, and also if you want to go to his school, feel free and go to the school and be part of the project, project, pro, programs and the things he's doing. And I believe that you also go places. Say amen. And associate your, you see, some of you, you're on Facebook listening to a lot of nonsense, but leave those things and go on his website, Google his name, listen to more teachings that he didn't bring here. Instead of being on Facebook and listening to people who are not speaking anything uh, uh, useful. Say amen. amen. Yeah. I've been in ministry for a very long time, but I, I find his brand and his style of teaching very, very, very nice. And I bring him along. Anytime I'm traveling anywhere, I said, we are going, you know, come and teach the people, come and teach the pastors. I've promised the pastors in Kita that I'm bringing one guy, Titi of Faith, to come and teach the pastor. They, are, they can't wait. They can't wait to listen. So they know they've been listening to me now. I'm bringing, as I'm bringing Pastor Matthew, they are bringing Isu there. They are excited. The Volta region in July will never be the same again. Yeah. We are invading the place with the word of God and with all social uh, medical interventions for the region. 6,000 of them have been displaced by the sea. The government has done its best. The body of Christ is moving in there to also do our best for our people. Are you coming or you're not coming? All right. So thank you, Bishop Titi Ofer. You are very honored. You are booked for next year. And thank you for coming year after year. And also thank you for your faithfulness and in, in your humility in responding to our invite. And I think that it is worth worthy of learning. So I'll see you. I invite Pastor Mike to come and give us the next uh, segment. Please, shall we be on our feet as uh, our guest preacher? And our daddy goes out. Hallelujah. Have you been blessed this morning? All right, please let's be seated. We'll be breaking for now and then we'll come back by 1 p.m. We'll come back at 1 o'clock. And our next session is starting at 1.30 with our First Lady, Reverend Mrs. Jim Mensa. Hallelujah. And so please don't, don't go too far. If you want to have something to eat, just look around and then get something to eat. Um, our next meal will be at around 4.35. Hallelujah. And so just go around, get something to eat, and by one o'clock, we are all here for the afternoon session with our first lady, Reverend Mrs. Jemensa. Hallelujah. And then tomorrow, we are going to do um, an ID card. We're going to do ID card for all uh, pastors of CEM. So tomorrow, when you are coming, please dress very well because you'll be taking, you know, they'll take your passport picture and then we'll do all those things for you. So tomorrow, the men put on your best, your suit, tie, and then the women also um, just come dressed very well. Hallelujah. We'll do everything at the Crystal Hall. So by the time you are going, you have your ID card. Everybody, right from the general overseer to whoever. Amen. Who I say amen. And so, um, when we close from this session and you haven't registered, please go outside and then write your name and then you'll be given your tag. Hallelujah. All right. This year, we'll be doing a lot of visitations. We'll be visiting you. We are putting together the apostolic team. Some will call you, will tell you, will be coming. Some will not tell you by the time you realize we are there. So when we come, not just preaching, 
I will come and inspect so many things. So try and organize yourself very well. Hallelujah. And then we are also trusting God that by the end of this year, we want to see the best branch, the best CEM branch, and then we'll give you an award. Amen. We'll give you an award. So we have our own criteria of finding out who is the best branch of CEM for 2022. And then we'll give you a very special award. So start organizing yourself. Daddy has preached to us on excellence. We've also heard uh, from Bishop Titi Affair, put all these things together, organize yourself very well, your branch, your pastors, your members, so many things. When we come, we are going to look at so many things. We have our own criteria and whatever. And then after that, we'll sit down. We went to Dansuma, we went to Goy, we went to Kwashima, we went to Golokwati, we went to Alavanyo, we went here and here, and then, 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 there. So we now sit down, and then we we'll look at this, that, 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 that. And then at the end of the day, we say, oh, Golokwati is the best branch for 2022. And then we'll do the presentation. Very powerful award. Hallelujah. The, fair, the best, the first best, the second, and then the third. And then next year to the same, the following year the same. All is to encourage us to put up our best. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. And so let's start uh, working on ourselves, our branches, and then uh, uh, we'll trust God that things will go well for us.